Well, it is great to look out of a congregation and see that you remain. And I always uh, am just relieved when I get back and everybody's still here. That's always a good thing. And I've, I've heard you've had good reasons to be here, though. We've had some good guest speakers, praise God. And, um, and you're still doing a great work here. And you've had a lot of opportunities here today uh, presented to you. And that's uh, really a testament of um, your willingness to serve and make a difference. And so um, we want to make sure the gospel is expressed through serving and loving in practical ways. And you've been given a lot of opportunities to do that today. Uh, so I'm Pastor Joey, in case you've forgotten. And um, I've been out of, out of town for a few weeks, and, uh, or at least a few Sundays. And so we're just glad to be to have arrived home. And those of you who told me that once one look is all it takes, you're absolutely right. When you see a grandbaby for the first or even the second time um, or visit, you know, it's a very special thing. And I'm not sure what is better, to see the grandbaby or to actually watch your wife interact with the new grandbaby. And that is just as fun. And so I think probably Donette's one of the most fantastic grandmothers in the world. She loves that little baby. Really loves that little baby. And we think about her a lot. And we've got lots of good pictures. So we're just really thankful for that. Is it just me or have you noticed that everybody in social media, especially Facebook, is like 80 years old now? I mean, have you guys noticed this? It's crazy. It is nuts. I'm at the Prophecy Conference in, in, uh, at Grace College this past week and just went down for an evening. And just before the speaker comes out and talks about the state of Israel and the BDS movement and the anti-Semitic movement in our world, um, just before that happens, you know, I'm in my seat and I get this text that comes in. I look at it. Go to slide number six for me first, if you would. Slide six. Those of you know my family, this is... Uh, yours truly to the right, this is Levi to the left, and um, or, yeah, in the middle, my wife to the left, and I'm not sure who took that picture, but almost cut Donette off there, but anyway, um, she's to the far left, and Levi's in the middle, he graduated from Indiana Western University. Okay, so I have no clue about this viral app that has just taken off, okay, and it's like, Everybody is doing this now. It like makes you like into an 80 or even 90 year old person. So Levi, without saying a word, right before the speaker comes out, I'm waiting. He drops this picture in a text. Go to the next slide. Boom. <laughs> it's like, Lord, what is happening to Levi? Did he, did he eat something he shouldn't have? I mean, did he overwork? I mean, what, what is going on? And so I look at Donette, she looks at me, and we are in existential angst. I mean, we're in a desperate situation. Because I think I, you know, I saw the face up, so I kind of knew what was happening, but I just couldn't believe it would be that realistic. And then I got emotional because I, and we both thought about it. It's like, you know what? We're probably not going to live to see that day. And so now we get emotional. And, and I get all philosophical and spiritual and theological. And it's like, oh no, I mean, what is going on? And, um, and so I can't help but think about it. And then you know how this goes when it's sent to the family. Uh, just go to the next slide. There's Megan and there's the baby and Donette and me and all that. Well, Megan, she's going to chime in. Go to the next. There she is. <coughs> And so now I'm just in that much more of a dire strait. And then you know what's going to happen when the Funkle finds out about it, right? The Funkle, the fun uncle, as Will calls himself. So go to the next slide. And there they are at Levi's graduation. It's a very wonderful day. It's great to have... Yes. <laughs> That's right. There's the Funkle and Levi as 80-year-old men. Right? And so, you, you know I have to respond to this. The preacher in me has got to respond. Right? And that is that boys and lady, I'm probably not going to see that day. But, I hope that when you get to this stage of life, you have lived your very best life. I hope you have. I hope you made good decisions. And I hope that you've honored God with your life. I hope that you still love each other. All right? And I want you to know that there's a set of parents waiting somewhere in another dimension that really want to see you. You can't miss heaven. You got to make it. Right? And so really, um, if you think about it, 
life's like that for sons of Adam and daughters of Eve now. It doesn't, it, it, it wasn't meant to be, okay? In other words, death is a foreign invader. It, it, and aging, these are foreign invasions. But something happened in Genesis 3, and we'll probably talk about that a little later in the series. And so as a result, we have to deal with aging and even dying and the reality of that. And aging and death and dying gives reality to today. If we didn't age and didn't eventually face death, we would waste our moments. We, would make, we wouldn't care what decisions we made. It wouldn't matter. So in a way, even death and aging and dying, in a way that causes us to realize that life is very precious. And we have to make good decisions now because we only have so many years, so many so many birthdays that we're going to celebrate. And it's important that we make good decisions all along the way. And that's our hope. All right? It's, that's our hope. That all of us will make good decisions. That God willing, we can reach those, uh, that phase of life. Those stages of our years. Uh, and that's the hope. But it doesn't always work out that way. There's no guarantees. But whenever that time comes, that we'll be ready. And that we'll be able to have a family reunion. And that's the hope. So as we think about this uh, series, Son of Adam and Daughter of Eve, um, I think that it's necessary for us to go back to our beginning if we ever have a hope of creating a better ending like that. And really, Genesis will see you home. It addresses all of the relevant cultural issues today. It, 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 it demonstrates in so many ways how we are to view life, how we are to view gender, and that's a big hot topic, how we are to, to view maleness and femaleness, uh, how we are to be viewed in the image of God. We're made in the image of God. That answers a bunch of questions for us, ethical questions, moral questions. Genesis will lead you home. And it will cut cross-culturally across all of the issues that you and I are facing today. It'll fly in the face of it. People call you silly. People say you're off the turnip farm, farm, right? They'll call you silly. An old, an old fuddy. Uh, uh, somebody that's kind of not with it. Somebody that's from the classic era, right? But Genesis will see you home. And if we're going to create a better ending, okay, we're going to have to go back to our beginning. And understand what it is God is trying to say to us. And that's what this series is about. I've talked to you about it one Sunday already. What I'd like to do today is I'd like to read a passage out of Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 31. And we'll read that together and focus on that. And I'll comment and say a few things about that. And then I really want to talk about the, this topic of and the notion of being made in the image of God. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's very, again, it's very freighted with meaning uh, when Moses writes this and talks about this. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? And if we understand that, we're going to have a lot of other ancillary questions answered for us on a lot of the issues that we face today. So what does it mean to be made in the image of God? You're made in the image of God. Okay? You're made in the image of God. Are you going to polish it? Or are you going to tarnish it? That's the question. Okay, you're made in the image of God. You reflect God. Are you going to polish your life in such a way that you're going to reflect a more accurate image of the glory of God that made you? Or are you going to tarnish it? You're going to make decisions that hinder the reflection. And that all that God meant for your life is not going to be seen because you've made decisions to tarnish the image of God in you. All right? And so I really want us to get that point because... Uh, the image of God, it addresses your identity, who made you. It addresses your humanity. You're a person, and that's essentially what it means. It addresses your value, uh, whether, whether you are a person, whether you're in a womb, or you're getting ready to go to a tomb. Everything in between is sacred. It's holy. You're a person. You have the capacity to do all the things that persons do. So you have value. And then you, of course, you have purpose. You have to have purpose. And so um, the fact that God made us, we know we have purpose. And one of his great purposes, it's very clear in the Bible, is that we love. And that we love uh, with uh, sacrificial 
self-abandonment. And so God makes that very clear. So the image of God addresses our identity, our humanity, our value, our purpose. And then I want to share with you a couple of stories. I do a, 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 a lot of reading because I want to have something engaging for you on Sunday mornings. I don't want to just bore you with the same phrases and cliches and stories. So I do a lot of reading across a lot of a very broad spectrum. I'm in a lot of different fields and areas when I read. I read men and women both. And it's very interesting what I'm learning. So I want to share with you what I'm seeing as the biggest challenge for men and the biggest challenge for women. It's what's showing up in a lot of the things I'm reading. And one of the biggest things that women will talk about is food and their weight. That's showing up in a lot of, a lot of different uh, uh, women's writings. Men, on the other hand, one of the biggest challenges they face is this sense of significance. They fear failure. Women have this food fight thing going on. Men have this failure fight thing going on. And, that, and so what we read and what I read and what I'm seeing is how they struggle with this. And when you really look at it, look at what the role food played in Genesis. It's about eating from a tree that she wasn't supposed to. And there's food crops up a lot in Genesis. It's one of the primal struggle of women is food, their weight, and the role that food is going to place in, uh, play in their lives. Okay? Men, on the other hand, struggle with the sense of failure. The sense of failure. Uh, and Adam struggled because God gave him a responsibility. God gave him a stewardship. God gave him the ability to lead and to love his wife and to... Uh, steward the the uh, garden right and so he fails at this and his primal his primal struggle now is failure he he resists it he doesn't want to be seen as a failure and if he's anything remotely close to a failure he will hide behind whatever he has to hide behind whether it's billfold whether it's a boardroom whether it's a ball field he'll hide whatever he's got to hide behind because he has to maintain the facade of a uh, facade of uh, significance and success this is what I'm seeing. And it really goes back to our primal struggles in the book of Genesis. So if we want to create, it, it is necessary to go back to our beginning if we have a hope of creating a better ending. Okay, that's what this is about. So, and then I want to share with you a couple of stories that amplify just a couple of these areas. Um, a couple of people who are polishing the image of God in their life rather than tarnishing it. Very, very important. I think that we wrap it up with some real life, you know, handles. And I think that those stories will help give us that. And so, as we look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that's kind of where we want to go today. So, Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26, we're going to read, Then God said, Let us make, on the screen, the creation account shows an ascending order. Okay, so God, God does, he says, let there be and let there be and there was and it, and it kind of works along that pattern. And then when we get here to Genesis, the end of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, we see this phrase, let us make, that's different, isn't it? Let us make mankind in our image. So this is the only one or creative act of God where there is a divine deliberation that takes place. It is a community of persons that's suggested here. And of course we know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. While that's not totally clear when Moses wrote this, but it becomes clear later. There is a community, a trinity of persons, a triunity of persons who come together. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and all, over all the creatures that move along the ground. Again, every time you see God creating, he says he created. But then the pronoun changes. And only when God, it comes to God creating humanity does he refer to his own plurality. And so when, when God creates us, he, 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 doesn't, he refers to himself not in the singular but the plural. And that's why we see then God said let us make man in our image in our likeness. It's not, man, it's not my image or, but it's our and it's not he but it's us. So the pronoun changes. And we're made in the image of someone who is not just a me but he's an us. And therefore, you and I won't be happy until we're not just a me, but we're also an us. This is part of your DNA. 
And before you can be an us, you've got to be a you. You've got to know who you are. That Genesis tells you that. If you don't know who you are, you try to have a serious relationship, try to get married, whatever, never going to work. Because you're looking to somebody to complete and meet, and meet all your needs and tell you who you are, and you can't work that way. You've got to get your identity from God. He's only one who can tell you who you are. Okay? So before you can be a me, you've got to be an us. Before you can be an us, you have to be a you. And the image of God, the image of God is the capacity for personal relationship. And I realize I'm, I'm a really, really condensing it down. God himself has never existed. Think about this. God himself has never existed as a single, lonely, solitary, isolated individual. He has always existed in a family of persons. He is Father, Son, and Spirit. This is who he is. This is what he is. And you're made in his image. That's significant. Verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them, okay? God created, did you miss it? Says it twice. He created, did you miss it the second time? He says it third time. He created. God created, he created, he created. How do, where do we come from? Who made us? What is behind all the order and the design in the world? God created. Turn the tassel. Graduate. Let's move on. Right? Let's move on. He created, says it three times, verse 27. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. F.B. Meyer says it well. Man was placed in the, in the world like a king. Okay, they're the servant kings. In a palace stored with all to please him, the sun to labor for him, the moon to light his nights, elements of nature to be his, messengers, flowers to send his pathway, fruit to please his taste, birds to sing for him, beasts to toil for him and carry him, and, and man himself amidst all the luxury, God's representative, his vice regent. This is as God made him. I like that. Verse 29. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant. On the face of the whole earth. And every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. What's so amazing. Is that after such heady theological truth. That addresses our identity and our worth. God wants to talk food. Right on the heels of that conversation. And if we don't have a proper view of food. And the fuel that we place in these bodies. It's going to be a negative impact. To the extent that everything else is impacted. And to all the beasts of the earth, verse 30, and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. There it is again. And it was, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made and it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. There's three things we got to think about. I'm going to focus on the second of the three. The first thing is God created human beings. Many, many people have offered, suggested, and suggested alternative explanations as, about, as to how we came to be. Won't get into that this morning. It's appealing to a lot of people. But it's man's best attempt to explain life in such a way that it, it excludes a need for God and our accountability to God. So we must talk about and think about First of all, God created human beings. Secondly, God created us in his image. And I'm going to come back to that in just a second. I'm going to camp on that this morning. And then the third thing we've got to think about is God created us male and female. And some today are asserting that gender is something that we choose. And that somehow bi biology is bigotry. And that, and that somehow gender is what we choose. And so we don't want to... I think even in England, they're not, they're not specifying, in some places, they're not specifying the birth of a baby. We're going to let the baby choose that. And you can't change gender, though. You can only rearrange anatomical parts. You can't change it. It's a farce. It's a, it's a mythical debate. You can rearrange body parts. You can present by what you wear and you can learn mannerisms but you can't change gender it's DNA it's chromosomal it's hormonal it's, it's built in you you can't change it we think we can change it you can't change it it's unchangeable at the, at the core DNA level of who we are and humankind can't stand that they can't change it 
And yet they tell themselves that they can. Okay? And so this is where we are today. If we're going to have a better ending, we've got to go back to our beginnings. It has to be. Because it defines everything that we're facing. So God created human beings. God created us in his image. I'm going to go there. That's really the main part of the sermon. And then God created us male and female. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. We will love you if you've bought in to an alternative explanation for who created the world. We're going to love you. You belong here. This is your family. We're going to stay with you as you work through that process. Fair enough? Good enough? Absolutely. No one's going to withdraw love, okay? We're creating the image of God. You may not believe that. We're going to love you even if you don't. God created us male and female. You may be struggling with gender issues, maybe things that's happened in your life, all right? We're going to love you as you deal with that, as you work through those issues in your life. We're not going to withdraw love. You're safe here. You don't have to run away. You're safe. You're safe. Attracted to the same gendered person, it's okay. You're safe. You're safe. We're not going to withdraw and alienate, okay? We want you to work through the issues. But at the same time, we want to be a ray of light in the darkness of a fallen planet. And we're going to hold to those Genesis truths that beckon us home and that beckon us into the kind of life, uh, the kind of life that we're being invited into. Not just in, in that we are a son of Adam, daughter of Eve, but we are Adam 2.0, we're Eve 2.0. Why? Because of Christ and what he's done in our world. So God... Back to the second item here then. So God is, God created us in his image. We're made in his image. And this is why every human deserves to be treated with respect regardless of their identity or their struggle. And so when we see this, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? It's a big question. All the scholars want to debate it. Some talk about dominion. Some people talk about language, our ability to communicate. Some people talk about our immortality. Some people talk about communion with God and stewardship and self-consciousness. Have you ever thought about that humans are the only animal or creature, not an animal, they're a human being, but they're the only creature that blushes? Has your dog ever blushed? Huh? Have you ever been talking to your neighbor and your dog comes and decides he's going to do number one, number two right in front of your neighbor? On his lawn? Does he blush? Doesn't even care. Gives it, pays it no mind. He'll do it again if you let him, right? Okay. We're the only creature that blushes. We're self-conscious. Animals are conscious. We are self-conscious. That tells us something. Some people look at it that way. Uh, we are people that know a sense and have a sense of morality. Man has a sense of right and wrong. We're morally aware a man wrote to dear, to dear Abby, Dear Abby, I am in love and I'm having an affair with two different women. I can't marry them both. Please tell me what to do, but don't give me any of that morality stuff. Her reply, Dear sir, the only difference between humans and animals is morality. Please write to a veterinarian. Some people have attempted to define the image of God in terms of the capacity of man. They talk about man being a moral being, a social being, a creative being, a rational being. The imago dei, which is the Latin phrase for the image of God, it's about who made me and it's that I, am a, I have personhood. You and I are persons. We, are, we, we, are, we live and we move on the basis of relationships. We understand fellowship. We understand love. We understand communion. We understand conversation. We understand sharing thoughts, sharing attitudes, sharing ideas, sharing experiences with others. And that is why when God created man, he immediately said it's not good for man to be alone. Why? Because the image of God is personhood. You and I got made by a trinity of persons. And the stamp of, of divine image means that every human life is sacred. Why? Because they have personhood. Every human being has intrinsic value, not just because of what they do or what they contribute, but just because they are human beings. They have value. You are more than a higher form of animal life. Man has reason rather than instinct. He's capable of thinking abstractly. Uh, he has the ability to appreciate beauty, 
to feel emotion, to be morally conscious. And above all, as we have pointed out before, man has the capacity and the need to personally relate to other people, especially to God, and being able to love Him and worship Him. That's personhood. And so you and I are persons. And this is where we get our worth. It's where we get our value. And when the Bible says that we are made in the image of God, we have to ask, what do I know about God in the first two chapters of the Bible? Because that's where it talks about it. And if I'm in His image and I reflect the glory of my Maker, what do I know about my Maker so far if I just look at the first three chapters of Genesis? We know He's a plurality of persons. Thus, we are built for community. We need community to to be a higher reflection of the God in whose image we are made. If we don't have community, we tend to tarnish in isolation. We tend to restrict. We tend to go our own way, to have our own gods. We don't shine as bright when we are, when we, like we would if we were in community. And so the, the polished image of God is to be in community because God is a community of persons. He loves to create. That's the second thing we notice that if we can, if, if we can have one observation about this God in whose image we are made, if we just make one observation, it's that that God loves to make things because he does. And so, thus, you and I are built to create. We are built to create, whether it's a farm, whether it's a a car, whether it's a product, whether it's a business, whatever it is, we are called to create, to make. And not only that, but what we also see in this God in whose image we are made, we are also... uh, do best in a community of persons we 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 do best when we create we are called to create and then also thirdly to admire what we have made to admire it in that which we have created because what does God do he stands back and he says it's very good it's good it's good it's good and then he says it's very good and so what do we know about God and in whose image we are made the community of persons he loves to make things and you do too And he loves to stand back and admire what he's made after he's made it. And you do too. Well, that was a good race. Or that's a good painting. Or man, I did a good job on refinishing that piece of furniture. When you do that, you're beaconing out. You're showing the beauty of who God is and how he's made you. You're reflecting your God. It's a beautiful thing. And people reflect God and they don't even mean to. The fact that we try to become male or female, we think those are, those are interchangeable. Hey, if you really want to be a rebel, come up with your own gender. Come up with your own. We don't even do that. We're even reflecting God in our, in our debate. Why? Because God says, I'm a male and I'm a female. Okay? And so, this is what we see. Now, it may be helpful to know that at the time of the book of Genesis was written, ancient kings of the Near East, they ruled these vast territories, and they knew that they could not be physically present everywhere in their kingdoms, so they commissioned statues of themselves to be placed in all the major cities of the realms. And when people looked at these statues, and this is what they did at the time that Moses wrote Genesis, okay? They looked at these statues, they were reminded of the authority of the king who ruled over them. And the statue was not the same as the king, but it represented the king, and, it was, and the statue was due the same glory and honor as if the king himself were present in that community. And so to dishonor the statue of the king was sacrilege. It was treason. And so humanity was to function in the same way. We are reflections rough representations of the creator in ways that his other creatures are not you're made in his image you reflect him you're positioned strategically in the world thus that you might fulfill your calling to marry and reproduce to work and create goods and food uh, and to uh, admire what you have made. You know, some people polish God's image while other people tarnish it. And I've shared that with you earlier. 
And in a post-fallen world, God's image gets marred. It, it, it is defaced, but it is not erased. You are a person. You remain a person. Okay? You reflect God. Whether you believe in Jesus or not, whether you believe in God or not, you still reflect the man who, the, 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 the entity, the triunity that made you. And in this defaced state, though, and we see this in Genesis 3, we don't create and do things or admire what we've created for the right reasons. We use our abilities to do evil sometimes and to selfishly enjoy the benefits that they might bring. And instead of creating in community, we fragment into disunity. We feel, we're filled with jealousy and envy and, and pride and sloth and wasted potential. And the question I got for you this morning, church, is are you polishing the image of God or are you tarnishing it? If my hunch serves me correctly, there may be some who may even be here today who say, I really don't want to reflect God. I've met a few people in my life that don't even want to believe in God or believe that they're reflecting of God, right? And maybe that's some of our journeys today. And if that's where you are, we love you. Stay on the journey. You're going to see the beauty of who God is. And so the problem is, it's not an issue whether you want to reflect or you don't want to reflect. The problem is you will always reflect something. And we become what we worship. We reflect it. Whatever we worship, we turn into that thing. And whatever, whatever you turn your gaze to, it rubs off on you and everything becomes colored by the idol. And when you worship money, you don't see humans, you see transactions. And when you worship sex, you don't see humans, you see objects. And when you worship power, you don't see humans, you see pawns. And, and, and God so graciously even gave us three gifts or three aspects of work and sexual, our sexuality and food, these three basic things he gives us in Genesis. And if you make a God out of any one of them, God's image gets tarnished and we eventually break down because we can't handle it. We run ourselves into the ground with our jobs. We get addicted to some aspect of our sexuality. We use food for comfort rather than fuel. And when we live for the glory of God and reflection of God, we are constantly checking in, Lord, does this reflect what you had in mind? That's what it means to be a God worshiper, a God follower. We're checking in. You know, I think it's interesting, Do Donald Miller talks about his dog Lucy. And uh, they would go to a place called Westmoreland Park and Lucy would play in the creek and she'd run up and down and she'd dive in the creek and she'd chase the ducks. He said Lucy didn't read self-help books about how to be a dog. She just is a dog. All she wants to do is chase sticks and ducks and run in the creek and, and, and run around in that park. And she said, and he said, that makes both of us happy. And then he says this. It makes me wonder if that was the intention for man. To name animals, create families, work their jobs, to, and, and keep looking back at God to feed off of his pleasure and our pleasure. Am I doing a good job? Is this what you had in mind for my work? Is this what you had in mind for my sexual relationships? Is this what you had in mind? How I treat food and how I view it? Always checking in. Always checking in. I think that maybe that's what it means when we live a God-glorifying life and we polish the image of God in us is that we're checking in and we want to not reflect these false gods that we can give ourselves to so easily. But instead, we worship our Creator and we're checking in to say, hey, am I, do I have this right? And we're in His Word and we're getting His counsel and His guidance. This is what it means to live a God-glorifying life. This is what it means to polish the image of God. You want to polish the image of God in your life? Grow your mind. Don't just spend countless hundreds of hours playing mindless video games. There's a place for video games, all right? But don't just waste hundreds of hours. Grow your mind so that your mind can reflect, it can engage and grow in ways beyond what a video game can do for you. Sharpen your skills. Steward your body. Be sensitive to what you put into it, what you do with it, how you use it. Love your spouse, mentor your kids, improve your community, create art, accept your gender. If you want to really worship God and he made you male, present as male. 
If he made you female, present as female. That's your first act of worship. To say, God, thank you for making me who I am. Right? Clarify your cause. These are ways to polish the image of God in your life. What about, how do we tarnish the image of God? How do we gratify ourselves and thus tarnish? We can fry our brains on drugs. And that limits our capacity. And praise God that Adam 2.0 and Eve 2.0 can find hope and strength in Jesus to overcome some of the things we created for ourselves. But we can fry our brains on drugs. Sometimes we're there and sometimes we're not. Right? It tarnishes the image of God, the capacity of, that you have to bring glory to Him and to live life that He's called you to live. Okay? Neglect your body. Input bad stuff, not just food, other things that would hurt your body. Okay? Engage in promiscuous sexuality. If you want to ruin your life, if you want to break intimacy with your future spouse, be sexually active before that day comes with other people. Okay? Focus on life's raw deals. Therefore, contaminate your spirit. Never, never pull your attention away from the raw deals of life. Swell up with pride and alienate people. Feed your addictions. Isolate from people. Live for nothing. Just live for you. Right? Live the animalistic, at the animalistic instinctual level. I'll just do what feels good. And I won't worry about what morality has to say about anything or God has to say about anything or whether or not I'm reflecting God or not. Right? We can tarnish the image of God, gratify the self, restrict what His ability is to shine through our life, or we can polish it. And this morning, my proposal is that you're going to like where you are when you stand there 80, you know, 40, 50 years from now as an 80-year-old man or woman you stand there and you wonder what you did with your life. You can look back on it and say, Well, God, I tried to polish your image in and through me. I hope you've shined as bright as you wanted to shine. Like I said, I do a fair amount of reading and uh, a broad range of topics. And, and one of the things that keeps coming up for the Daughters of Eve is the topic of food. Right on the heels of that, they will talk about their weight. And right on the heels of that, they will talk about eating disorders to control their weight. Again, it's, it's a rampant topic. Rampant topic. Everybody's writing on this. From millennial authors to older authors, younger authors. I mean, everybody's writing about this. This is, a, this is a huge thing. How can I polish the image of God in this particular sensitive area of my life? Okay? And so it drives a lot of people and their fears, a lot of women, their fears. And so the challenge is food, it's your weight, it's your obsession with security, and we see this, it's, it's just interesting to me that, that the great primal uh, point of disobedience involves food. Isn't that interesting? That there's food involved in the garden, okay? And it still is a primal challenge. And so, uh, will I go to food for comfort and security or will I go to God for comfort and security? And so this is the big question that you daughters of Eve are going to face. And so Lisa Bevere, um, go to her slide if you would, Lisa and her husband. Um, she once was in bondage to her weight. She was an anorexic. And she said there was a time in her life when she thought, all she thought about, or she never really thought about her weight. But then when she was 16, uh, or back when she was 16, she had no awareness of her body weight, she says. She was very active. She swam a lot. Uh, she ran track. She ate whatever she wanted to to eat right here in her home state of Indiana. Her junior year of high school, she pulled her Achilles tendon and she was on crutches, but, she, but though her activity level significantly uh, decreased, she kept eating like she always had while she was in training. And she gained weight and she couldn't fit in her jeans and some people commented on it and she promptly lost the weight again. Then she went to college at the University of Arizona. And she went through the sorority rush and she pledged a house before school had even started. And she said, I couldn't, even, I couldn't help but notice that all the West Coast girls were tan. They were beautiful in their designer jeans and ponytails. She said, I had lost weight and I looked just fine in Indiana. But out in Arizona, she said, my body looked like an Indiana corn-fed heifer. And that's just, I'm just telling you how she writes it out, about it, okay? She said, girls are way thinner than she was, and they would complain at dinner, I'm so, I'm so fat, and I'm just 
tell you what she writes. I'm so fat. Look at these thighs, they would say. And those girls were smaller than me. And she thought, if they are considered large or over or obese or fat or whatever, then she must be obese by comparison. And so she got busy. She lost some more weight. And when she went home for Christmas, her mom flipped, flipped over how frail she looked. And she even took her to the doctor. And Lisa said, I was afraid that I'd get overweight again. And it started to feel like everyone was trying to force food on me. She went to Christmas parties. And she spent time with friends. And she got a lot of attention. And all the boys in high school that ignored her before, now that she's coming back, they all came back around and started asking her for dates. And they ignored her in high school. But now they're asking for dates. She said, I loved it. But by the time she went back for her next semester at the University of Arizona, sure enough, she had gained some of the weight back. Her sorority sisters had the same struggle. And this is not just a female problem, it's also a male problem, so there's application here. It was a love-hate relationship with food. She exercised to the extreme, but also she used laxatives and diuretics in her battle with weight, and this eventually created a major health problem. And she had to come up with something different. At dinner one evening, she noticed a sorority sister who was super thin, but also was eating everything on her plate and then some. And this girl never exercised, ever. And so in private, Lisa went up to her and said, hey, what what are you doing? How do you do this? She said, I eat everything I want. And then I go to the bathroom and stick a toothbrush handle down my throat. I empty of dinner and then I brush my teeth. That's how I do it. Lisa said, show me how. And Lisa said for the first time that evening, I noticed a lot of my sorority sisters walking into stalls with toothbrushes in hand. She said, I never noticed it before. She said, I tried doing it. I couldn't do it. She went home that summer. Wonderfully, she heard the gospel for the first time. And she became a Christian. Jesus filled a void in me that I had tried to fill with attention from boys all those years. I began to relax, realizing that God loved me just as I was. She was made in God's image, you see. And this gave her value. And she understood that she wanted to be a a, a higher reflection. Not a tarnished image, but a, a polished image of God through her life. I stopped my excessive exercising, dieting, and drinking. And I began to look healthy again. She got engaged. She got excited about the wedding. She enjoyed food with all of her other Christian friends. She gained some of the weight back while back at the university and figured she'd slim back down before the wedding in in the two months that she'd have home in the early part of the summer. And she got home to parents who were fighting and they were in turmoil. Her parents eventually separated. All her friends were out of town. So she didn't have the community around her. She was missing her fiancé, John. She got bored and stressed and ended up either binging or starving to deal with it. And her days consisted of getting up, weighing herself, eating breakfast, weighing herself, running errands, eating lunch, weighing herself, wedding plans in the afternoon, dinner, weighing herself, getting discouraged, binge eating to wrap up the day. And then came the day of reckoning for her. It was four weeks until the wedding. And she needed to rent a slip for her wedding gown. She she brought her wedding dress with her so that they could determine the correct slip size. And her wedding gown buttoned down the back. And she stepped into it so the sales clerk could button it up. And the clerk says, honey, there has to be a mistake. This must not be the correct gown. There is no way you can fit into this gown. The buttons are three or four inches apart in the back. The sales clerk stepped away and Lisa looked in the mirror. And she realized that she had outgrown her wedding gown in in a month's time. And it was an expensive gown her her parents had bought for her. She said, I got home, I threw myself down on the floor and I grabbed my Bible and I poured my heart out to God and she listened. This is what she heard. Lisa, your weight is an idol to you. Whenever you are lonely, you eat. Whenever you are angry, you eat. Whenever you are bored, you eat. You eat. Whenever you are depressed, you eat. Whenever you are happy, you eat. She said that about covered it. God said, you don't come to me. You don't read my word. 
You eat because it's easier. You feel good about yourself when you're thin and you're bad, you feel bad about yourself when you're, when you're not thin in your opinion. Your weight controls your moods and your life. It is your idol. And I saw it, Lisa says. It was all true. Food and food had dominated my thought life. It had tormented my rest. I had not even shared my faith because I felt like I couldn't. Because of my weight issue. She was listening very closely now, of course. And she said this is what she heard. Lisa, I will heal your metabolism. Do not diet. Do not weigh yourself. Separate yourself Fast for three days on juices and water and I will rid your body of its cravings. I will teach you how to eat again. Write down the, the way you, you should be and put it in your Bible. It's like, God, you made me. What should I weigh? She had no idea. She said, I was just so warped in my understanding of this. I just waited on God to tell me a number. And a figure just kind of floated into my head and she wrote it down on a piece of paper and she tucked it in her Bible. She put the scales in the attic and apple and strawberry juice and water for three days and she went on walks with God. During that time she prayed, she drew close to God. After three days she ate food, but only until she was satisfied, not engorged, and she began to see food as good, not her enemy. Her wedding was only a few days away now and she had lived like this for three weeks. She had no idea how much she weighed, but she had to try to she had to try on her wedding dress and it fit her and it even hung a little loose. And her wedding went wonderful, and when she came home to change into her going away outfit, God stopped her and said, Now you can weigh yourself. You have permission. She got the scales out of the attic. And she watched the needle teeter and totter and finally settle. And she looked at the slip of paper in her Bible. Bingo. Exact same number she had written down four four weeks earlier see Lisa Bevere became a daughter of Eve 2.0 she began to worship the one true God right her creator God she stopped worshiping weight food and God she says therefore I tell you Matthew 6 do not worry about your life what Jesus says what you will eat or drink or what about your body what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes Jesus is your security and Lisa Bevere is polishing the image of God in one of the key areas of struggle for all daughters of Eve. We see a hint of that in the primal passages of Genesis. What role will food play in my life? And Jesus is going to shine brighter through her because she's now aligned in such a way that he can shine brighter and more clearly through her life. This is your challenge, daughter of Eve. Quickly, son of Adam. You love adventure and accomplishments, right? We think about how, and, and what I'm learning is that men love to write about how big their billfold is, how their business succeeded. And here's the principles to get your business to succeed. They love writing about that. They love writing about how big their billfold is or how awesome their bedroom is. And when they don't have those accomplishments, it's amazing how quickly they all go into addictions to numb their pain The fear of failure plagues them. And men have this need to know that their work makes a difference. And they fear failure. And the primal challenge from the Garden of Eden is for Adam to be significant. But he's reminded every day of his shortcomings and he fears rejection. And this is big. Jeffrey Marks. Go to the next slide if you would. Jeffrey Marks was the ball boy for the Baltimore Colts back in the 1970s. For four straight summers, Marx picked up towels. He laundered socks. He hauled ice. He cleaned the floors. He stayed late and he loved it. And there was a player by the name of Joe Ehrman that connected with him. And he would ask him questions and things. And, and Jeffrey Marx, the ball boy, loved being immersed in the world of men and just how, they, how that, the, the team spirit. And Ehrman would really, he would nearly rip your head off on the field as a defensive tackle. But off of the field, he would cut up with you, he talked to the ball boy, and, and, and he said that he, he enjoyed the close camaraderie with the other players. They also chased women, played cars, sought fame. But all the parting stopped when he realized he was going to lose his brother to a disease, and that's exactly what happened. And Joe had a question. 
the defensive tackle for the Baltimore Colts in the 70s, who, who would rip your head off on the field, he had a question. What am I living my life for? I lost my brother. Who's being glorified through my life? Am I polishing the image of God or am I tarnishing it by the way I'm living? Am I restricting all that God might want to do in my life? It presented a crisis of significance for Joe Ehrman. Well, Jeffrey Marks, the ball boy, he eventually left. He went to college. He got a degree in journalism. And he was skimming the newspaper one day in New York City. And he saw that former Baltimore Colt defensive tackle Joe Ehrman was now a pastor leading an incredible ministry in downtown Baltimore, mentoring young boys, young men. Volunteer head football coach and his high school team was a powerhouse. He was intrigued. He looks him up. They talk he, and reconnect. And, and it ends up that Jeffrey Marks, the ball boy in the 1970s, linked up with Joe Ehrman, the defensive tackle in the 1970s. He starts, this ex-pro football player starts mentoring this journalist. And it turns into a book called Season of Life, A Football Star, A Boy, and a Journey to Manhood. Airman explained, we don't just coach football, we show the boys how to be men. We give them a code of conduct for manhood and help them find their transcendent cost to live for. And we all have to have that. In our drive to be significant, Airman talks about false masculinity. Son of Adam, it is easy to try to mask what you are, who you are with your athletic ability. And that gets recognized pretty early in life. It moves to sexual conquest in puberty. Using girls and bragging about it. And that gives way eventually to economic success, which comes later in life. Airman calls it ball field to bedroom to bill, to bill fold. That's where men try to find their masculinity. And he said it's all facade. You can't get past the athletic accomplishments, the sexual feats, the economic successes. You can't get past it. Why? Because it's what you're hiding behind. And if we're, and if we're really not worth knowing, and that's how we feel, and if others find out who we really are, they're going to walk away like everybody else has. So I've got to make them think my billfold's bigger. My boardroom exploits are fascinating. My athletic ability is number one. Joe Ehrman, the ex-defensive tackle for the Baltimore Colts in the 70s would, would tell you that's not masculinity. Masculinity has to be defined in terms of relationships. If you look over your life at the end of it, life wouldn't be measured in terms of success based on what you've acquired or achieved or what you own. It's going to come down to this. What kind of father were you? What kind of husband were you? What kind of coach, brother, teammate, friend were you? Did you accept responsibility and follow through and finish? Did you lead with courage and go against the flow? Did you promote justice on behalf of others? That is, endeavoring to understand the pain of other people and do something about that. Sons of Adam can be solitary, lonely men. They can do heroic deeds, but never be intimately connected to anybody. After relationships, Airman's second criteria for masculinity is that all of us ought to have some kind of cause, some kind of purpose in our lives that's bigger than our own individual hopes, dreams, wants, and desires. Biggest bank account, okay. Nicest house, okay. Prettiest girl, okay. Most powerful job title, okay. Airman says, not masculinity. It's the facades behind which we hide. Masculinity, what is it? It's knowing what that transcendent cause is. It's giving yourself to it. Something's going to outlive you. Something's bigger than you. Bigger than your happiness. Bigger than your joy. It's accepting responsibility. Following through and finishing. It's, it's leading with courage and going against the flow when necessary. It's promoting justice on behalf of others, understanding the pain of other people. God made me, I'm responsible to Him. He created me to stand for something. And He wants my life to point toward Him. Joe Ehrman is polishing the image of God in his life. Jesus is shining brighter through Him in downtown urban places of Baltimore. Why? Because He saw it. He understood, I can either live my life to tarnish the image of God, or I can live it to polish it. I want to polish it. And this is what I'm called to do. And so, this morning, maybe it's not really about the food. 
It's about the faces over a table of tasty dishes. Maybe it's not about the football. Maybe it's about friendships and mentoring that take place in and around the game. Son of Adam, daughter of Eve, these are your challenges. You have some decisions to make. Choose wisely. Polish the image of God in and through your life. It will outlive you. Honor your transcendent calls. Honor the God who made you. Make decisions now so that when those face app pictures really, you know, one guy said, I got in trouble. He said, I, I LOL'd somebody's face that was actually that age. Okay? That's what happens. Yeah, he LOL'd. Oh, wait a second. He didn't do the face app. That's really him? Okay, that happens, right? When you get to that stage of life, when you're there, you're going to like where you are if you've lived to polish the image of God rather than tarnish it. You know, it's kind of interesting to me. On the great curtain, I'm going to close with this. Thank you for staying with me a few extra minutes this morning. On the great curtain that separated the holy, holy place from the holy of holies in the temple, you know, where the mark of the covenant was, there's a picture of Eden that was sewn into the curtain. Do you hear me? A picture of Eden was artistically created into the curtain itself. And so in, in, in a way, mankind has always been trying to get back to the garden, back to the holy, most holy place. And that picture of the Garden of Eden was there. And you'll recall also that there was an angel with a sword and the sword went back and forth on the eastern, at the eastern side of the Garden of Eden. And, and it suggested, and, and what it's implying is that the only way we could ever get back into the Garden was that somebody had to undergo a penalty, a punishment. Somebody had to pay a price so that we could get back into the Garden. Several thousand years after Adam and Eve, there was another son of Adam that was born. Virgin born. A part of the Trinity that said, let us make in Genesis 1. He becomes flesh. He dies on a cross. And when he died, that curtain with a picture of the Garden of Eden stitched into the fabric of the four-inch curtain, it rips from top to bottom. He went under the sword that was flaming in the Garden of Eden. He went under the sword. He absorbed the punishment of man's rebellion, disobedience. And the Garden of Eden just opened up to everybody. We can all walk right in with no fear. That's what he's done. And the Bible talks about a second or a last Adam. And it's so imperative that we find ourselves in Him. And we are in, when we are in Him, we are son of Adam 2.0, daughter of Eve 2.0. Are you polishing the image of God? So, daughters of Eve, okay? Big issues, you're polishing the image of God. Is, is He who you go to for comfort, joy and strength? Does He tell you who you are? Sons of Adam, is he your success? Is he your victory? You see, your victory rests in him. Where Adam failed in the perfect environment, the second Adam succeeded in an imperfect environment, and salvation is the effect for each of you and, and for me. You pray with me? Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your great grace. Thank you for what you've done in and through Jesus. We're so thankful. I believe in practical messages. I've tried to do that this morning. I ask and pray you would touch this congregation. Whatever their issue may be, whatever their challenge point may be, that as a daughter of Eve, you would set their identity and that you would tell them who they are and they would really allow you to be the sole source of their comfort and their hope and their strength and their purpose and their transcendent cause. And I pray for the sons of Adam right here this morning that you would touch them. Some of them have absorbed a lot of things, maybe some failures along the way. There's not one of us here that can't say, hey, there's been moments of failure in my life or what I've seen as failure. And some don't want to really talk about that or even want people to know about those things. But I ask and pray you would help them to rest in you today. 
that you are bigger and greater than boardrooms, billfolds, and ball fields. You're bigger. <laughs> Praise God. And because I'm made in your image, whether or not I hit a home run or strike out, whether or not my wallet is thick and padded or whether it's empty and sparse, whether or not the boardroom is powerful with, with lots of prestige and lots of kickbacks and bonuses, or whether it's just humdrum every day, whatever it is, Praise God, you're my sufficiency. You're my significance. I'm holy, I'm set apart, I belong to you just because you made me. And that's all that matters. Now may I live from that. And would you help us each to polish the image of God? We, everybody here knows exactly what that means. I've only given a couple examples this morning, but everybody here knows where they are tarnishing the image of God and where they can polish it. May we walk out of here with a new resolve. Understanding that our sufficiency is in Christ and Christ alone. In Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me? You've been a great group. Be careful what apps you load and what you do with those. There's all kinds of weird things that happen, so just be careful.